So I just want to read something real quick. Um, something that I read recently. Do you know that when you come to Jesus, you come to someone who knows you perfectly? Your problems, your burdens, but more than that, he has vowed before the Father in heaven to carry those burdens for you. So if you're carrying burdens, hand them over. He's faithful. And if you would like to stand, or if not, let's get our worship on. going to know the song. This was written by our pastor, Jeremy. Let 
we just thank you and praise you that your Holy Spirit is here, Lord. And we lift this time up to you, Lord, and pray, Father, that you would move among your people as you teach us your word through our speaker tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right. Wow. That was like being in heaven. <laughs> well, I don't know what it's like to be in heaven, but man, if I could imagine it, that was beautiful. All right. Ooh. This thing's scary. All right, ladies. Let's turn in our Bibles to Titus 2. Make sure I'm on the right session here. So... We've been praying for this conference for quite a few months now. The Lord kind of gave me the theme of it back um, while we were in California in November of last year um, during the pastors, lead, uh, Calvary Chapel Pastors and Leaders Conference. And I just felt like the Lord was just speaking to me about the need for practical, practical instruction um, cause I'm, I'm, I love practical instruction. Um, I just, you know, you know, sometimes we can get into the mumbo jumbo, not of, you know, spiritual terms, but sometimes I just want, give me, to, give me the nitty gritty, like teach me, show me. <laughs> I'm a rule follower. So I just want to know, like, what do I need to do? Um, and we've just been praying and, um, over this and what the theme is and what the, the, the passage is going to be, and um, I couldn't think of a better one than Titus 2, which is very practical for all of us in all our different uh, seasons of life. And so, um, and then as we were, we had kind of our three different sessions planned out, and I felt like there was needed to be some kind of intro. Um, and as I was praying, and I, you know, I'm like, why did I, why did I commit to two sessions? <laughs> Um, but it needed to be done. And um, when the Lord spoke to me what he wanted to share to me to share today um, on this specific one, I, I was weeping because I feel like so much, you know, when you're doing studies like this, so much of it is just like piercing your own heart. <laughs> and, um, and so this, this was near and dear to me and my heart, and so I pray that it speaks to you. If it doesn't, if it's not specific, specifically for you, um, I pray that the Lord would speak something to you. <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead and pray over his word. Lord, we just want to hear from you. Lord, my words mean nothing, um, but your word, Lord, speaks and stands the test of time. And so I just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would come, take over, and just... Um, Instruct us, teach us, give us ears to hear what your spirit wants to speak to us today. Father, that we would be open, we would be ready, Lord, to change, to be molded, shaped by you, Lord, and um, that's why we're here. Lord, we want more of you. And so um, just speak to us now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter two, and just to give us some context for the, the whole passage, but Really, what we'll obviously be focusing on is the women's section. But in verse 1 of Titus 2, it says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young men, or the young women, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that, the, that cannot be condemned, and that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. 
Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So this is a letter from Paul, the apostle, to Timothy. Um, to give a little background, um, Timothy was commissioned. He had traveled around with Paul um, on many of his journeys. But at this time, around AD 63, um, Paul had sent him to this island off the coast of Greece, right? <laughs> Crete is the name of it. And um, Titus was a Greek believer or a Gentile Christian who had gotten saved and traveled. And um, Paul commissioned him and sent him. There were several churches that had been planted on the island of Crete, and so um, Titus was sent there. Um, there were some problems that Paul had asked Titus to kind of clear up on this island, these churches that were there. Um, some doctrinal beliefs, some old ways that were not being passed that were kind of um, remaining. So this letter was a short yet powerful exhortation on what Titus needed to focus on and what he was commissioned to do. So we see two different problems that Titus came to kind of fix um, in these churches. Um, the island of Crete um, where it was full of, of course, um, let's see, let's see, the large island off the coast, so I'm getting mixed up here. Um, it was full of people who were still kind of stuck in Greek mythology. So a lot of these Greek Christians that were getting saved believed in Zeus and all of these Greek gods. Um, and there were a lot of them were, that were kind of almost comparing God to their to Zeus. And Zeus was known for lying, cheating, you know, being promiscuous with women, of course. Um, and so it was very important <laughs> that they realized that our God is not this. <laughs> and so um, he came to kind of fix some of those problems. Um, in verses, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, it says of them, um, a prophet of their own said about the Cretans, they're always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. So this was quite a task <laughs> that, that Titus had. Um, but I think coming from him being a Greek himself, um, I think that was a good person to send there to minister to them and to help them because um, he kind of knew their culture. Um, they were confusing the Christian God with the attributes of Zeus. So there was a lot of work that needed to be done, um, a lot of um, word that needed to be taught. So the second problem we see were the Jewish Christians that were... Um, that were saved. Um, there were, they were taking over the churches of, in Crete. They were kind of like being, making themselves leaders of these churches, and they were enslaving the Greek Christians under the Jewish um, practices, you know, circumcision and things like that, stuff that Jesus came to kind of set people free from having to do. Um, in chapter 1, verses 10, 11, it says, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, talking about the Jews, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. So, you know, they were coming in, they were wanting these positions, and they were kind of enslaving people into a legalistic um, mindset, which Jesus came to you know, to put it put away with, you know, he fulfilled those things. And so all we need is, is faith in Christ. And so these Jewish believers were kind of, you know, 
not doing good things. So Titus came to kind of set those things right as well. So it was twofold kind of a ministry that he, he had his work cut out for him. So what was Paul t- um, telling Titus to focus on? We see Titus 1, verses 5. For this is the reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So, you know, set in order the different leaders in the churches. Kind of get, get out some of these guys that have taken over and set good godly men who love the word, put them in leadership. Um, that was one of the tasks. Titus 1.9 says, Hold fast to the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So, um, you know, holding fast to God's word, that's super important. That's our guidebook. That helps us know, that helped him know, you know, what he was supposed to do. So Titus 1.13 says, This is testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So sometimes, you know, when there's false teaching and false doctrine, going on like sometimes we have to kind of take it and you know say no we can't do this you know and so um i i don't want that job (laughs) just kidding um titus 2 1 says but as for you speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine he goes on to teach how men and women young and old were to behave in the daily life that what we just read in Titus 2. This is probably one of the most practical chapters for men and women and their roles in the church and in life. So it's just a real practical chapter. I love it. I love practical. Titus 2:15 says, "Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you." So here Titus was coming, probably a young whippersnapper, you know, um, and was put in charge of these churches to kind of set them in order to remove some of the people that have taken control and replace them with godly men. And he's being charged to not let them despise you, which is so often the case sometimes when, um, you know, people come in and, you know, it's hard for us to submit to, to leadership, you know, especially in our culture now, nowadays. And so Paul was just really encouraging Titus, don't let them despise you. You do what God has called you to do because it's a worthy cause. Um, the truth is a worthy cause. And so it was important that these, these churches were healthy and that the people of these churches thought rightly about who God was and how to live out their faith. And so that's what Titus was meant to do. Um, my heart in this conference is to do just this um, for us ladies um, in our day, in our culture, and all the things that have crept into the church just like in their day. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, ladies. We have, we have things that seep in that we don't even realize are false doctrines. Um, so that's my heart in some of the things that we, we talk about this weekend is just to kind of get back to what does the word say about how we're to be wives, hu- um, husbands, <laughs> um, how to love our husbands, how to love our children, um, how to be honoring in our workplace and in our singlehood, all honorable things that God has called us to, um, but how do we do it rightly, biblically? So, um, so as I was praying about it and just really seeking the Lord to show me what are some of the things that, um, that, that, you know, that have crept into our culture and in our world and, 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 and then have crept into the church. And I, you know, I had this and that, and I had all these little things that were kind of, and it was so interesting. The Lord just kind of sucked it all in and it's actually all those things are under one banner. And, um, the word that came to my mind was the word humanism. And um, so the definition of humanism is an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human matters rather than divine supernatural matters. Human belief, humanistic beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. Seems like a good cause, right? Its system of education and mode of inquiry that originated in northern Italy during the 13th and 14th centuries and later spread through continental Europe and England. At its heart, Renaissance humanism is based on the idea that individual humans have beauty, worth, virtue, and dignity. 
This idea was able to take hold from the 14th to the 16th centuries, mainly due to the decline of the Catholic Church. So at this time, this was kind of right after the Dark Ages kind of started to kind of cease. Um, people were coming out of that time. It was a really dark time, obviously. And um, the church, the Catholic Church, started to be to decrease um, its hold on society. And, you know, a lot of literature, you know, um, kind of promoting the beauty of man, art, all of these types of things were coming out during that time, and people were starting to kind of embrace it, get, you know, kind of be done with the church and the legalism that the Catholic Church brought in. Um, and so it was just kind of this, like, springboard into this humanistic mindset. Um, it stresses the importance of human values and dignity. It proposes that people can resolve problems through science and reason rather than looking to religious traditions. Humanism focuses on helping people live well, achieve personal growth, and make the world a better place. Francis Schaeffer said this about humanism. Humanism is not wrong in its cry for sociological healing, but humanism is not producing it. So we see here um, that it's this mindset of focusing on self. It's kind of coming in and saying, you know, we're going to start worshiping ourselves. Um, what humanism has caused in our world. So there's symptoms of everything, right? There's fruit out of the mindsets that we have, right? Just like we learn in the Bible about the fruits of the Spirit. There's fruits of humanism. And they have slowly and very um, methodically made its way into our whole entire world. And so um, we see a success-driven world. Um, since humanism removes God from defining what equals success and worth, now success and worth are defined by man. Scary. <laughs> those who achieve a certain status, those who are deemed popular or beautiful, those that have certain amounts of wealth, those who have the best education, those that have accomplished the most are the ones that are the praised and honor, honored. Life becomes an unending race to be successful, to be beautiful, to be wealthy, to be intelligent. We see mental health issues on the rise. If you don't seem to measure up to these humanistic standards or whatever standard is defined in any given environment by any group of people, then the result is depression, envy, hatred, anxiety, self-hatred, suicide, a lack of contentment, and a workaholic-driven world where there is no end to the pursuits. Feminism, that was one of the things that I kind of clamped onto and the Lord was like, Humanism. <laughs> it's come out of the humanistic mindset and it put a great emphasis on what women can accomplish and achieve inside and outside the home. Then uh, this has slowly taken root in our culture. This has resulted in women pursuing education and careers far more than ever before. And I want to just say this. That's not a bad thing, okay? Um, but I'm just kind of try to think about it all in the sense of, of what, it, what it has caused, okay? Um, trust me, I'm, I'm all about using my gifts and talents for the Lord and how he leads me. Um, but I'll, you'll see as I kind of go through some of this how the enemy has used it as well. Um, less, me, less women are marrying and having children than ever before. Like if you look at from just in the last 20 years, it goes like this. <laughs> the scale. I mean, there are just less marriages, less children being had, um, less amounts of children being had. So instead of three or four, it's like one and two um, because it's harder and harder to kind of keep up with the, you know, keep up with the, the, the career and the home and the, you know, daycare and all those things. It's harder. Um, so then we see a passivity of man taking hold, right? We, we used to, back in the 50s and 60s, it was men went to work and women were in the home, right? Like, it went almost to the, f so far to the extreme that we way overcorrected through feminism, the, the feministic movement. Um, and so now we see women in the workforce, women taking big, giant, 
you know, leadership roles, and it's caused men. I mean, this is the thing, ladies. We can do quite a bit. We are very skilled. We're very intelligent. Um, just because God has an order for things doesn't mean we're less than. And so when we take a place that wasn't designed for us to take, the men in those roles, because men are um, success-driven, they're all about accomplishment, working with their hands, if they're now competing with the women in the workforce, they're going to take a step back. And that's what we see happening. Not with every man, but there's a lot of men that are staying home, watching the kids, doing the, the stuff, you know, taking the role of the mother. Um, and this is not in any judgment towards all the different things. I have family members that have this kind of system set up in their home and that you have to be led by the spirit in everything you do. But I'm talking about as a whole, as we see the culture changing and shifting, and we see now, you know, gender roles being completely diminished and all this stuff. This is all a result of humanistic mindset. Um, so it's just, I paint the picture so that we can kind of see how the enemy has really infiltrated the world and then how it shifts into the church. Um, so do we see this mindset, this humanistic mindset in the church? I believe we do, yes. Celebrity pastors, pastors who get chosen or promoted based off of worldly standards um, and accomplishments, looks, personality, resulting in what? Church abuse, pastors falling into sin, leading believers away from God, causing believers to worship the man rather than God, overreaching um, overachievers in church, Unrealistic expectations on leadership, success-driven congregations, focus on numbers rather than spiritual growth, resulting in burnout. So many more people are leaving ministry altogether. They can't keep up. Um, many worship leaders nowadays who 20 years ago could get a full-time job, they're not talented enough. They're not skilled enough. And this is, we see this more in like bigger cities, um, I grew up in the worship movement, you know, in Calvary Chapel, and now in Southern California, if you have the gift to sing or play guitar, they won't use you unless you're, you know, Hillsong status, um, because that's the, that's what they've, expectation that they've um, set. So it's hard. I, I know a lot of friends who sing, and, and they, they can't even be on their own worship teams. They can't use their gifts. Um, Entertainment comes at a cost, so the numbers who must increase to fund the lights and the worship teams and the sound equipment and the visual effects. The Bible has to be changed to fit humanistic viewpoint, right? Jesus was a loving savior, so women should be pastors, and homosexuality isn't a sin. Social, justin, social justice reigns supreme, we look at disciples and apostles as positions to seek after and to look up to without realizing their true intent. Servanthood over enslavement, shepherding over lordship. It all then results into, so the result of that is what do we see kind of like, because we've been living in this, we don't, sometimes don't even realize we've been living in it. Um, what do we see happening there's distancing from each other. People are crushed under the achievement mindset, so we grow more distant to protect ourselves from the judgment, the judgmental eyes, and the unrealistic expectations, resulting in an inability to receive true biblical, biblical correction. Ladies, I've seen so many times where someone gets offended and they just leave the church. This isn't biblical. This is meant to be a family. There is a biblical way to even deal with us hurting each other. You know, we are supposed to go to each other, take that to the person and work it out. And that's the biblical peaceful way. But now it's like people are just, well, I'm done with this church. And they just church shop until you know, they're never going to be happy. And then people just leave the church altogether because they can't handle, you know, there's this level of expectation in people's minds and they just can't handle it. And so, so many people have left the church over it. Um, let's see. So then we have a lack of discipleship. 
Nobody wants to be discipled because they can't handle people seeing all their yuck, right? We got to keep up these appearances. <laughs> I've got it all together, especially up here in our homesteading community. Like we, we do everything. We make the, you know, uh, sourdough and we make the, you know, we have our gardens and we have all the things, you know, and we're homeschooling too. And we've got, we're part of this and we're part of that. I mean, man, I, I have to like, I get all, I, I came from a suburb and didn't do anything. I, <laughs> I have four chickens. That's all I can handle right now. Okay. I can't make, I can't bake bread. No sourdough for us. I did do kombucha. Is that what it's called? Woo. And we don't even drink it. <laughs> It just, I keep filling it. My husband drinks it, but anyway. So you know what I'm saying here, okay? So we lack discipleship. And this is something I've, over all my years of ministry experience, talking with different pastors and leaders, this is a common thing that they all say, people lack discipleship. Because we're so afraid of being vulnerable with one another. We're so afraid of saying, I don't have it all together. I don't know that much about the word. I don't even have a devotional life. We're afraid because of the expectation, because humanistic mindset has crept into the church. So we lack fellowship. We lack discipleship. No godly friendships, iron sharpening iron. We're meant to rub along each other. We're meant to hurt one another. Like, I know it's hard and it's awful, but how are we going to grow and learn to love, learn to forgive? These things are so important, ladies. Don't run away from the church. Don't run away from hurt. It's important that we work things out, that we have those hard conversations. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to say this now. I'm going to hurt you, and I'm sorry now for it, okay? <laughs> but I love you, and, and that's what you have to believe. You've got to believe the best about each other. Um, we're not able to re- address real-life issues in marriages and parenting or in singlehood. Like, how many of you guys are bearing these hard things alone and you just won't tell people the fights that you have with your husband that just can't get over and you don't know who to go to? You don't want to tell people you're having a hard time parenting your kids, that they're ruling your home. You don't want to tell people that you're depressed and single, living with this expectation that you're supposed to be married. And then women stop being content in the home. We see all these influencers and all these people doing all these things, making all this money, and we're just home washing the dishes, doing the laundry, doing the homeschool thing, and we're wiped. And so we we have this discontentment to do more, to be better, to do, you know, to fill that, that thing, that expectation. And we're hard on each other. The older women... Don't always understand the younger women. And you guys have all these expos. I did this. Do you know I walked in two miles in the snow and, you know, I don't know, with my baby in my hand and, you know, I'm just kidding. I don't know. I don't know what you guys say. (laughs) But the younger women are afraid of the older women. And there's a divide, right? We're divided from each other. Lots of divisions because we're so afraid of being real and loving and letting the the walls drop. So, resulting in having a great need to achieve more to feel worthy. Do you ladies feel crushed under the weight of expectation of not being what you think you should be, not being pretty enough, not being skinny enough, not being funny enough? Ladies, I'm not, like I might be goofy up here, but I'm kind of a serious person. I'm not like your super bubbly, jumpy up and down, you know, type person. So I, you know, I've gotten a lot of people who misread me. Um, And so I have to like make myself, like I got to do it. You know, I got to put it on because it's, people tend to read me the wrong way. And so there's that expectation I have to perform. Um, But what I ultimately do is I've come to realize that it's my love for you that makes me do that. So that's okay. That's a worthy cause. Um, so anyways, I have a graphic that I created to kind of help you guys see what it should be and what it shouldn't be. So the first you see there is man. That's the humanistic mindset, right? It's all about achievement. It's all about expectation, about getting to the top, being the best, being the prettiest, being the skinniest, being, having it all together, right? 
Um, and the second one is a little more chaotic, and I just love it. <laughs> That's life in, 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 our, in our Christianity, right? We're all in this race together. It's not about going up. It's not about achieving. It's about going forward, right? It's a race, and we're all in it together, okay? Um, I know there's like a finish line. That finish line gets pops up for each of you, so it's not just one person wins, okay? Everybody is following after Jesus. We're picking up our cross. We're following him through the power of the Holy Spirit. That lady's got her Bible. There's a, there's a working lady even, okay? I put a working lady in there. It's good. Um, and that lady there with number one, aren't she's, got, she's worshiping the Lord. Um, so I just love that. It looks chaotic, but that's life. And there's no standards. There's only following Jesus. There's only being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so as we, you know, um, let's see, let me go here. Um, This is what I want you guys to think about this weekend as we study these things, these important things um, in our marriages, in parenting, in singlehood, um, the working world, that we, we root out that humanistic mindset that's in all of us. We all have standards that we try to live by, um, but the only standard that we should live up to is the word and what he says about us and who we are in Christ. Um, I wanted to take you to Colossians chapter 2. And I have it in New Living Translation, so I'm sorry. It's going to be a little off as I read it. But I want you guys to highlight as you read it along if you have, we give you guys a highlighter if you want to highlight in your Bibles. Every time it talks about um, Jesus or in him, um, talking about Jesus or being in Christ, with Christ, in him, all of that. So I'm just going to go ahead and read it with you ladies. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1 says, I want you to know, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church of Laodicea, and as for many other believers who have never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to be complete confidence. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him. Um, Skip down to verse 6. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking, humanism, and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them and publicly by his victory over them on the cross. 
So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths or sourdough bread. (laughs) Don't let anybody condemn you, girl. Okay. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come, and Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of this world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Wow. I, I couldn't have like even thought up a better passage for this whole message. It's all about Christ. The passage in Colossians is not saying that godly living or following rules is wrong. What he's saying is that fulfilling some earthly standard or even a religious standard apart from Christ is utterly useless in giving someone victory over the flesh. Christ has wiped away the list of requirements against us. We have no ability within ourselves or without him. Romans 3 says, from 10 to 13, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. The only way we have any hope is by being found in Christ. That can speak differently to two camps. One camp of people who feel crushed under the standard, under the expectations, the requirements of perfection. They should feel complete relief that Christ has already done it. You don't have to perform. You don't have to strive. You don't have to measure up to the next person. You don't have to meet people's expectations. All you are required to do is abide in Christ. His spirit will lead you. His spirit will lead you, ladies. Jesus has given you all the power to perform what he leads you to perform. As we learn his word and as we live in his spirit, we will become more like him through his resurrection power. No comparisons, no rat race, no condemnation, just love, joy, and peace. This is what we get in Christ, ladies. This is the joy. This is the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross so that you can have this, that he could wrap you in his righteousness. It is not about our works. It's not about our accomplishments. It's not about what we can do for him. It's about us accepting what he's given us and then walking in the spirit, saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do today? Okay, I'm going to do these dishes with all my heart. Okay, I'm going to do this with all my heart. Lord, help me to know what you want me to do, not what this person says I need to do, not look the way that this person says I need to look, not make the sourdough bread. (laughs) Sorry, I don't know what I have against sourdough bread. I I just can't bake. No, I'm just kidding. I can't bake sourdough. I can bake. I just can't bake sourdough bread. Anyway, all right. So... What does it say here? Where's the second camp? Second camp, there it is. Second camp people. (laughs) Those people who are accomplished people, those people who have seemed to have it all together, be careful. Be careful that that's not the badge you wear. 
be careful that you don't take pride in that and you see it as of yourself because that's, that, won't, that won't satisfy forever. And it's only going to ruin relationships because nobody can attain to what you have. <laughs> um, so be careful. Be careful that you don't take credit. That maybe you can do it all, but maybe you shouldn't do it all. Pray about what, Lord, do you want me to do so that I can be more successful? Because let me tell you, in all my skills and talents, if it's not done through the power of his spirit, I still pray when I go on the photo shoots. I am not confident in my skills. You know, I want the Lord to give me that supernatural gifting and, and ability. Um, and so, you know, whatever accomplishments, whatever skills you have, offer it up to him. And he can, he can you know, he knows how to multiply, right? Um, and it's so much better done through and in him than in ourselves or in our flesh. So we must get back to Jesus as our foundation, his spirit as our guide, and remember that we must stop living by the worldly standards or performance and comparisons and start accepting and living the life Jesus died to give us, a life complete in him, right? 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you obtain it. And then Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, Jesus... <laughs> He turned it all on its head. He was, you know, in Philippians 2, it talks about he humbled himself. You know, he was, he's our prince. He's our king. And he came down as a man, as a baby, the most humblest form, right? He turned it all on its head. He said, it's not about, you know, all of these things. You know, it's about me and it's about relationship. It's about all that Christ came to do so that we could be restored in a relationship with him, so that we can walk with him, we can be empowered with him, we can be filled with his presence, his spirit. So how should we factor in what we will be learning in Titus 2? As we read through our passages this weekend, please remember that our teaching and instructions is coming from a place that says, these aren't things attainable without the power of the spirit. Don't let legalism and the enemy lie to you that you're a failure, okay? If there is something that convicts you this weekend in any way, all you gotta do is run to Jesus. Allow him to break you, repent, and be filled with the power of his spirit. Don't let Satan or the lies of humanism make you think that you are a failure, or compared to others, you need so much more work, because we do. We all need work, okay? We need Jesus. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we just come to you, Father. We need more of you. Lord, less of us, more of you, God. May we decrease so that you can increase. Let us put you as our foundation, not ourselves. Lord, I'm tired of living for myself. I'm tired of living in this rat race of this world has told me what I need to do, what I need to think, what I need to wear. Lord, I want to just live for you. I just want to be filled with your spirit. So I just pray, Lord, right now, God, that we would in our hearts, Lord, just surrender. Lord, if there's anything that we've been holding on to, anything that's been crushing us, any anxieties, Lord, any envy, Lord, that we've been holding in our hearts for, for other people, Lord, any criticisms of other people, Lord, I pray that we would just lay it down right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, Father, we would give it up. And we'd stop running this success-driven life, Lord. And that we would run a spirit-filled life, God, led by you and the power of your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your word that instructs us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and saving us, Lord. 
having mercy and grace upon us, Lord, washing our sins as white as snow and wrapping us in the beauty of your righteousness, Lord, that we can wear it as a garment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We pray you would bless this food that we're about to partake um, to our bodies. I pray, Lord, that we would just have sweet fellowship and that you would bless the rest of this conference. In Jesus' name, amen.